John was born deaf and mute, and it must have been a crushing blow to his parents because at this time in the 1760s, there were few if any prospects for someone born without the ability to hear and speak. They must have wondered day and night what poor John was going to do with his life, and they probably imagined that he would always be with them. They couldn't have been farther from the truth. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Whisperer Museum. Tonight launches this year's Master Series, and this year a series of seven installations, lectures, and receptions throughout the year. And now it is my honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Paul D'Ambrosio, President and CEO of the Fenimore Art Museum and the Farmers Museum, Incorporated in Cooperstown, New York. Thank you, Katrina, and thank you all for coming out tonight. I think we all know what's coming weather-wise in the coming months, so I really appreciate your willingness to spend uh, a beautiful evening like this uh, here with me. It says a lot about your uh, support and commitment of this great museum, and I do want to take a moment to say how honored I am to be associated in some small way with the Worcester Art Museum. Uh, it has been a great pleasure of mine uh, to work uh, with your uh, absolutely superb uh, professional staff here. Matthias Waschek, the director, uh, John Seidel, and uh, Betsy Athens in curatorial. Absolutely the consummate professionals and, and just a, a joy and a, and a delight uh, to collaborate with in a project uh, like this. And of course, my deepest gratitude uh, goes to Dave and Barbara Crashes, who put together one of the most remarkable folk art collections in America with great care and discernment over the course of 50 years. And that really is what uh, we're celebrating here uh, tonight, and really is the, the, the whole genesis of this talk. Um, I do like to let people know a little bit about where I come from, uh, Cooperstown, New York. The Fenimore Art Museum, shown on the screen, uh, is a museum that was founded in the 1940s, housed in a, a Neo-Georgian uh, colonial revival building uh, and that was greatly expanded in 1995 to house one of the country's most important collections of Native American art. But we've had one of the great folk art collections in America since the 1940s, and that's really uh, my area of expertise. That's how I became interested in the subject matter and, and how I've done all the work that I've done over the past few decades. Cooperstown, New York, of course, is famous for other things. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with the word Cooperstown. We have a very famous, very mysterious crop circle in the middle of town. <laughs> A lot of theories abound about what it's for, but a lot of people come to see it and the museum that it's attached to it. And I, do, I am very fond of saying that we're the only art museum in America to expressly forbid baseball bats in the galleries. Um, all that being said, downstairs in the gallery, you'll see many great things, but you will come across an unassuming, quietly absorbing picture of a, a, a young girl, really a, a baby, one year old child. And uh, you will find yourself coming back to this image time and time again. There's something about it that draws you back uh, many times to it. Uh, is it the sense of childhood innocence? Is it the, the gaze of the child that, uh, that just seems to engage you directly? It's hard to say, but it, we know that the artist of this portrait was a unique person, someone who uh, really has an important uh, place in uh, the history of a number of different communities in 19th century America. Uh, his name is John Brewster, Jr., of course, and I want to tell you about him here tonight. John Brewster was born in Hampton, Connecticut in May of 1766. He was the third child of a physician, Dr. John Brewster, and his wife, Mary. Uh, Mary died when John Jr. was just 17 years old. Uh, six years later, Dr. Brewster married a Ruth Avery of Brooklyn, Connecticut, and they had four more children. John was born deaf and mute 
and it must have been a crushing blow to his parents because at this time in the 1760s there were few if any prospects for someone born without the ability to hear and speak. They must have wondered day and night what poor John was going to do with his life and they probably imagined that he would always be with them. They couldn't have been farther from the truth. Uh, there is not much known about John Brewster's childhood. Uh, we think he might have been able to write a little. Uh, we do know from his own words that he couldn't speak. Uh, he very likely communicated with his family by the use of improvised signs that in the deaf community are known as home signs, just signs that are obvious to the people in the family, um, but unintelligible to many, many others. Uh, this is probably why so many of his early portraits are of family members or close friends. Um, let me back up just a moment. The whole genesis of this project was a, uh, a book done by Harlan Lane uh, about John Brewster. Harlan had done this book uh, back in 2005, 2006, and he wanted to include uh, information about Brewster's portrait career. So he got in touch with me and I collaborated with him on the book and we put together quite a body of work. Uh, of course, the pioneering work on Brewster was done in the 1960s by Nina Fletcher Little, and she had identified 60 or 70 Brewster portraits. We identified more than 200, uh, including 72 signed works. And the, um, the Lane book is on the right. The catalog that we published in 2006 is on the left. Uh, Dave Crashes, I should say, was a tremendous help in putting together uh, that book really, really rallied support for it. The Reverend James Cogswell is one of the early um, friends of the Brewster family that documented uh, John's early life. He was a diarist, and in 1790, he, in, he entered into his diary on December 13th, Dr. Brewster's son, a deaf and dumb young man, came in this evening. He is ingenious has a genius for painting and can write well and converse by signs so that he may be understood in many things. He lodged here. However, on February 7th of 1791, Cogswell writes, Brewster, the deaf and dumb young man, was at my house when I came home. He tarried and dined here. He appears to have a good disposition and an ingenious mind. I could converse little with him, being not enough acquainted to understand his signs. I pity him and feel thankful to God for the exercise of my senses. These two entries are somewhat contradictory. We know a couple of things from them. Uh, Brewster must have been painting by 1790. He said he had a genius for painting. Uh, one has to wonder, how did Brewster demonstrate his ingenious mind uh, if Cogswell couldn't understand him? Were his signs intelligible or not? Uh, if Brewster could write, why didn't Cogswell communicate with him that way? Uh, he must have been able to write well enough, perhaps, to make some of his rudimentary signs understood. Uh, we just don't know. There are more questions than answers. But we do know that Brewster had a native intelligence that people noticed and that he was, uh, had a um, ability, artistic ability, that people also noticed. In about the same time, early 1790s, uh, Brewster received some instruction from a Connecticut painter by the name of Joseph Stewart, uh, who married the daughter of the pastor in Hampton. He was a friend, uh, and, uh, a friend and a fellow pastor of Reverend Cogswell. Uh, Reverend Cogwe Cogswell's son, Mason Cogswell, seen here uh, in a portrait by Ralph Earle from this time, played a major role in uh, Brewster's life. Uh, he was Earl's major patron, and he was helping to establish Earl in Hartford uh, at the time. Uh, but his presence and his, um, the, his work with Ralph Earl helped bring the influence of British portrait styles to Connecticut, and in particular the English grand manner that Earl had learned from Benjamin West uh, in London. And this had a profound effect on Brewster and, by extension, on Connecticut portraiture. Uh, Mason Cogswell would also help found the Connecticut Asylum for the Education and Instruction of Deaf and Dumb Persons in Hartford, 
which Brewster attended from 1817 uh, to 1820. And Earl, uh, like John Singleton Copley, uh, adapted the English grand manner to America by creating realistic settings and casual likenesses, uh, simplifying the style uh, actually quite a bit for American taste. Stewart and Brewster emulated the style but simplified it even further. Here is a portrait that Brewster did. It's one of the earliest known works by him. And it, is, it depicts his father, uh, Dr. Uh, Brewster, and his uh, stepmother, Ruth Avery Brewster, done in Hampton, Connecticut about 1795. It's in the collection of Old Sturbridge Village. Very simplified grand manner portrait, life size, full length likeness with, uh, an, you know, for Brewster, an elaborate interior setting showing prosperity and propriety, but done in a flat limner style uh, as compared to Earl or Stewart. Uh, we don't know the exact nature of the training that Brewster received from Stewart, but Brewster was an accomplished artist, you can see here, uh, by 1795. This is a complicated uh, composition. You can see the, you know, the basic uh, symmetry of it, the diamond shape created by Dr. Brewster's legs and the uh, parting draperies up above uh, and the view out the window with the landscape. The only thing about this portrait that I find a little bit uh, disconcerting and it's something that you can chalk uh, up to inexperience is that Ruth Avery Brewster appears to have no lower body. <laughs> that may have been the only way that he could have fit her behind that drop leaf table uh, and he improvised and he did it. And that's what a lot of artists of his kind uh, just managed to do. And these portraits were perfectly uh, acceptable to the patrons. Of course, to his parents, it would have seemed like a miracle that their son could paint this well. It's interesting that Dr. Brewster is not looking at us also. I uh, have no answer for what that may or may not mean, but it's an interesting um, part of this portrait that, uh, you know, that one tends to reflect upon when viewing it in person time and time again. Another a uh, set of likenesses that Brewster did at the same time. This one, July uh, of 1795, as identified by the letter that the man is writing on the, uh, on the table on the, on the right. This is of Mr. and Mrs. James Eldridge of Brooklyn, Connecticut. Uh, <clears throat> Ruth Avery Brewster was from Brooklyn, so they were likely friends of the family and very closely acquainted uh, with the Brewsters, and so they would have been uh, pretty safe and appropriate uh, portrait subjects for the young John, but magnificent likenesses, very imposing. Uh, again, life-size, full-scale, and uh, beautifully uh, painted. Again, a simplified grand manner, but perhaps even more ambitious in the patterning of the carpet and the elaboration of the landscape in the background and things like the, the lace fichu that uh, Mrs. Eldridge wears. You can see that John is not a timid artist. He is definitely an artist of some confidence. He knows that he can paint in a style that uh, people of means uh, can appreciate uh, and like and, and hopefully uh, patronize. And so he showed a lot of promise by 1795. Uh, he showed a lot of promise for um, embarking on a portrait career. It is a risky venture for someone unable to speak or hear because you, one can imagine uh, at this time and perhaps any other, uh, painting a portrait, painting a likeness, particularly in an era before photography, when this may well be the only visual record that one might leave, you can imagine the need for communication between the artist and the sitter in terms of the artist being able to meet uh, the sitter's needs, which sometimes aren't even expressed to people that can hear and speak uh, and have to be coaxed out. Uh, you can just imagine how Brewster was able to do this. I'm not 100% sure, but he must have been an incredibly perceptive man. Uh, and really, I think, incredibly good-natured and um, pleasant to be around because it took a fair amount of patience, I think, to get through this process, even in, under the best of circumstances. And these were not always the best of circumstances. In late 1795, uh, John's younger brother, who also, like his father, was a physician, Dr. Royal Brewster, uh, married a woman from Buxton, Maine. That woman's name was Dorcas Coffin. 
and I believe that she uh, might have been Mary Coffin's aunt. John uh, Brewster presumably then moves to Maine. There are newspaper advertisements from about 18 months later that say he had been painting in Portland. Uh, these were newspapers back in Connecticut that say in late 1797, for 17 months past, he has been, Brewster has been improving his art at Portland. It suggests that he moved back and forth between Connecticut and Maine on a regular basis. And he had indeed been improving his art in Portland. And the commissions that he was able to receive after first going out on his own, leaving his family home, and the family and friends that he knew behind, following his brother and his brother's new wife to this uh, remote, then remote area of Maine. And you can see uh, Portland in the green patch called Cumberland on the larger of these two illustrations. You see Portland, if you move your eye directly left, you can see Buxton. It's about 16 miles inland. Can everybody see Buxton? Uh, certainly accessible to Portland. The uh, likenesses that Pryor began to do are quite remarkable. They are no longer the full-length, life-size portraits that he did in Connecticut. He becomes a little bit more practical. This is Reverend Samuel Dean. Of course, these people, not everybody can afford a full-length portrait. Uh, and so he begins to do these half-length likenesses that are extremely compelling. And they're fairly important subjects. Reverend Samuel Dean, very well-known a uh, man of the cloth in Portland. Very solid portrait. Look at the attention paid to the face. This painting uh, is just remarkable in that it really does uh, draw your eye to a very carefully delineated, uh, beautifully painted face. Uh, in his book, Harlan Lane talks about Brewster in, um, and his deafness and the attention that he pays to, to sitters' faces and how um, in his research, uh, he has seen demonstrated, even through scientific studies, that uh, people who are deaf pay much closer attention to very subtle facial cues than hearing people do. And in particular, they never break eye contact. The connection with the gaze is the most important thing in deaf communication. And that, I think, is clearly expressed in many of these portraits and in particular, the portraits of children. Uh, Mrs. Dean, just as solid a character as the Reverend uh, is seen here in her portrait. The only little uh, superfluous bit of ornamentation is that little tiny flower in her hand, uh, which, gosh, you can, almost, you can almost imagine her protesting having to hold it, because it was just too pretty, I don't know. But it, you know, the character, the, he's just a master of characterization. And this is a painting that is in the Portland Art Museum and they have it displayed in the McIntyre House and it comes with a tradition of having been painted by John Brewster. And I pose it really more as a question here than a solid attribution. I am not 100% sure that this is a Brewster. Uh, we had it in the exhibition with this question mark uh, next to it. But it is interesting that it does uh, very solidly carry this uh, attribution which has come down through the generations. It shows a bit about Brewster's reputation in Portland. Uh, this very clearly is a Brewster, Mr. John Bourne, also done in Portland at this time, 1796, uh, 1797. Uh, again, another beautiful portrait that seems to show this vertical alignment of the, the, the face, uh, the chest, and, and when shown the hand, John Bourne must have had a, a few dollars fewer than some of the other sitters because he couldn't afford for Brewster to paint his hand and so the hand is tucked into a vest that's just it's just business it's nothing personal if you have fifteen dollars you get your hands you have twelve I'm sorry um, but anyway it's beautifully done the, the palette look at the green felt under his hat and of course that that um, that cream colored vest uh, and the facial features and then the eyes are incredibly compelling uh, Mrs. Bourne uh, hesitate to say the word lovely, but it is lovely, it beautifully painted uh, in that um, the color of her dress uh, really does set off the, the uh, flesh tones of her face as well. And so Brewster is very quickly developing as an artist and, and getting these uh, great commissions. And as I said, he goes back and forth to Connecticut. Newspaper ads place him 
back in Connecticut in 1797 and 1798. And then in 1799, he paints two of the most remarkable portraits, I think, in all of American art. Uh, they are of uh, Comfort Star Migat, M-Y-G-A-T-T. -T. Uh, this is uh, Comfort with his daughter Lucy, and then Comfort's uh, wife uh, with her son George. Uh, unbelievable portraits. This, these are Brewster's, really emblematic of, of Brewster's new mature style. This one in particular, or this pair, grand manner in scale, but really brilliantly stripping away all the superfluous details and focusing on the person, the pose, the costume, and of course the faces of the sitters. And look at the directness of that child's gaze upon you. Uh, very frontal, forthright, just strikingly engaging. That gray uh, background really sets off a fairly subtle palette and gives it a boldness that it otherwise uh, would not have. Uh, and the thing that's most remarkable about this portrait, and I think uh, of great import to uh, any discussion of children's portraiture, we do see quite a lot of portraits of children. We see quite a lot of portraits of adults. Every so often we see portraits of mothers and babies. We rarely see portraits of adults with, with children of toddler age and, um, and older. It's not that often. And when you do, they are never showing any signs of affection that you see here. This is the, the touch of that very light, gentle touch of the hands there. Uh, is remarkable, and I think it speaks volumes about Brewster as a person. Brewster never married, he never had children of his own, uh, and yet this uh, sentimentality, this uh, sense of uh, familial affection is really, I believe, uh, profound. And you see it in Lucy Miguet's portrait with her son uh, George. Of course, because of the size of Lucy's dress, George has to stretch a little more than perhaps he would have been able to in real life, but nonetheless, uh, he gets it done. And, um, and there you are, another phenomenal portrait, a great landscape background. I think because of the, the, the width of that dress, he had to place Lucy a little bit over to one side of the, uh, the likeness, and it would have been too much negative space not to have a window view. He might have talked them into paying a little more for a window view. And uh, there you have it, uh, beautiful, beautiful likenesses uh, and just hallmarks, as I said, of Bruce's mature style. The management of the gaze and its relationship to, to deafness uh, is just uh, very striking in these. The penetrating grasp of personality, uh, the muted palette that highlights flesh tones, superb draftsmanship. Take a look at the two Brewsters in the exhibit downstairs. You'll see absolutely beautiful uh, draftsmanship in them. Uh, and the command of this flattened, uh, linear, and strikingly patterned composition that characterizes the most visually effective uh, folk portraits. Uh, but the focus on the person, the pose, the costume, the face, uh, just uh, incredibly, um, incredibly uh, forthright and direct. And also, a lot of people have seen, and I, I tend to agree, I've seen so many Brewsters, there's something about them, there's a serenity there's an ethereal uh, quality, and uh, I think also a palpable sense of silence in these works that is quite profound, knowing what we do about Brewster and, uh, and, his, and his life. Uh, mysteriously, as 1799 draws to a close, Brewster places two ads in a Poughkeepsie, New York newspaper. The ads state that he is staying at a Captain Stephen Hendrickson's, they also say that he has been deaf and dumb since birth, uh, and it was the first time in an ad that he actually comes out and says that, and that all who may please to favor him in his unfortunate situation will be satisfied. So it sounds like he is beginning to get the picture that people will patronize a deaf person, uh, some of them out of curiosity, some out of pity, uh, but he's a businessman, and he's doing this uh, to make a living, and he uh, very, um, I think, explicitly uh, uses the fact of his deafness in his advertisements for portrait uh, patrons. In about 1800, he paints the two daughters of Ruth Avery Brewster, his stepmother, half-sisters of his, 
This is Sophia Brewster, uh, his stepsister, down in Hampton about 1800. And it's inscribed with the sitter's birth and death dates. And she died on April 24th of 1800. So I believe, you look at this portrait, you look at that landscape, you see a sunset in the background. I believe this is a posthumous portrait. Uh, and it was quite common at this time to paint posthumous portraits. Painters were often summoned uh, to houses before, prior to burial of a child to sketch the face and then do a portrait of the child in a variety of ways, uh, as if the child were alive. Uh, he never painted the child as dead. Uh, that's for the grisly daguerreotypes that come later in the 1840s. Uh, but the, look at her, the way that she, uh, it must have been somewhat, um, I mean, incredibly painful, but irresistible for a parent to have this likeness uh, in their home. Uh, the other child did live, Betsy Brewster, painted at about the same time. We know she lived because she poses for Brewster again in 1830. But again, a very beautiful forthright portrait. Look at those eyes. Uh, Brewster, it's really funny, Brewster had such an affinity for children, and there's so many different, I guess, things you could imagine as to why that is. You know, he's not somebody that had a lot of experience with children of his own. Uh, they seem to, from these portraits, they seem to have liked him. They seem to be drawn to him. Their connection with you is really a connection with him at the time the portrait was painted. And so, one wonders, why was he so successful with small children? Um, maybe because he was more animated, more interesting uh, than hearing people. Uh, he seemed to have a special rapport uh, that may indicate that uh, they were drawn to him and he had a real fondness for, for toddlers. Uh, it's especially poignant, as I said, because he had no children. I was once giving a tour of the Brewster exhibit when we had it at Cooperstown, and I was pondering this question out loud, and one, um, young mother in the audience piped up and said, well, it's obvious. If he couldn't hear, he couldn't hear them squawking, he had more patience with them. <laughs> and so, you know, maybe it's that simple. You never try to out-diagnose a mother. So, uh, back in Maine, about 1800, 1801, he continues to get extremely important commissions. These two portraits, uh, the richest man in Maine, Colonel Thomas Cutts on the left, and his wife, Elizabeth Cutts, uh, on the right, these are in the Sacco Museum. Uh, done, uh, you know, for being done very early in Brewster's career are very, very important uh, likenesses. The Cutts family ends up patronizing Brewster over the course of three generations. Um, but uh, they, the Cutts family had amassed a fortune in lumbering, shipbuilding, and trade, as many successful business people did in Maine. Uh, the, Colonel Cutts owned many ships. He was the wealthiest man in the area. And uh, Brewster did these portraits in um, about 1800, 1801. They're the only known standing portraits of adults that he did. And uh, my God, they're imposing. They, are, they verge on scary imposing. Uh, Colonel Cutts, what a figure. I mean, these are um, Puritans of propriety and austerity. The, the Brewster expresses their rigid uh, verticality. Uh, really uh, relieved only slightly by the diagonal of that cane that the colonel holds. Uh, and then it's very interesting, the um, Mrs. Cutts dress extends beyond the canvas, which I think uh, adds stability to a likeness that would otherwise be too narrow uh, for, um, for its subject. But they do begin a tradition of Brewster painting many Cutts portraits and he paints their son, Foxwell Cuts, uh, at about the same time. He looks like kind of a spoiled kid compared to his father. Uh, he um, he uh, excelled in shipbuilding until he was wiped out by the War of 1812, and he died insolvent. This portrait and that of his wife were sold at an estate sale uh, after, after his death in 1806. Uh, but again, beautiful portraits uh, done in what is now uh, probably becoming a signature style that people of that area uh, recognize. Other signed paintings just done about a year later place Brewster down in Newburyport, Massachusetts, where he lived with the Prince family uh, for three months and did a, um, a series of five different portraits. This is the most elaborate of the, of the five. This is James Prince and his son, William Henry, 
done in November of 1801. It's in the Historical Society of Old Newbury. Uh, James Prince owned part of the Newburyport Wharf and was a customs official. He also had interests in banking and insurance. And uh, you can you note uh, incredible interior detail here, more elaborate and more ambitious, and perhaps, again, the result of the sitter's wishes. And one, again, ha can only imagine how those were expressed. But the Chippendale secretary bookcase with the brass drawer poles, the portable writing desk. Uh, it's really interesting to think about Brewster becoming part of this household, a non-family household, for, for three months. But it's a remarkable portrait, and he does an even more remarkable one of uh, James's daughter, Sarah, sitting at a piano forte, a very rare and expensive item in 1801, uh, signifying uh, her refinement. The, the song is the, uh, the Silver Moon. I couldn't, I'm not going to try to sing it for you. Um, she's 16 years old and uh, dressed in this white, very angelic dress very simplified, striking composition, uh, very, very engaging, and again, the eyes just hold you. Uh, Brewster worked uh, after leaving the Prince family. He worked in Portland again, and then down in Boston, and he advertises in the Boston Citizen uh, in 1802. Uh, John Brewster, portrait and miniature painter, uh, deaf and dumb since birth, at Mr. Rufus Farnham's 14 Summer Street. Farnham was a goldsmith and a jeweler. And uh, this is another, I think, example of Brewster's uh, advertising his condition. Uh, and um, it also is, the, I believe, the first time he advertises as a miniature painter. Uh, we own at the Fenimore Art Museum the only painting known from his sojourn in Boston. This is the Deacon Eliphaz uh, Thayer and his wife, Deliverance. It was probably full length at one time and, and cut down uh, because the three-quarter um, composition is not common for Brewster. Uh, but it is, again, done in the very same style that he's been practicing all along and just seems to be perfecting. In 1805, uh, Royal Brewster finished his federal-style house, and John moves in with his brother and will, would spend the next uh, 50 years in this house. And also about 1805, Brewster begins signing his name and adding uh, the word Pinxit, P-I-N-X-T, which means painted it, uh, and the date at the back of the top stretcher in the reverse of the painting. So it's interesting to speculate about the coincidence of moving into this home and beginning to sign his work. Uh, did he feel that his status was elevated by residing in this new house, this grand house? Or did he feel compelled to build his career in order to contribute to the family income to meet the needs of a more expensive household. It's hard to say. But he continues painting and executes some beautiful works at this time. Our own in Cooperstown, Francis O. Watts uh, with a tethered bird, uh, dated 1805, very ethereal, very serene, and in a very distinctive landscape, strange, almost like a dreamscape. Um, this type of landscape appears elsewhere in window vistas, but not as a complete background as it is here. Uh, this was done in Kennebunkport, Maine, and uh, Francis O. Watts grow, grew up to become one of the founders of the YMCA. Uh, the bird on a string can be seen as a symbol of human mortality, and it's interesting that Brewster used this, uh, if he did use it as a symbol, how did his, the sitter's parents request it? How did they go about adding it to the portrait? Uh, it's fortuitous that they did. <clears throat> it really does make the portrait much more ethereal and, and light, but it is just a lovely, lovely picture. These might be Francis's parents, a gentleman and a lady in a landscape. They have the same provenance as Francis. In the same landscape, uh, the grass is not as green, uh, it looks like it's kind of dry, but it's interesting. They have the sparse trees on this very deep plain, and the sitters are elevated above it, almost like a Renaissance portrait, leading back to a distant uh, mountain range and some suggestion of church steeples and settlements in the back, and then this almost darkened sky, which would, you'd, you'd read as a, as a coming storm if it weren't for I think the, um, the more practical notion that, that set off the faces against the background 
uh, more effectively. After 1805, Brewster begins to move away from uh, the full-length portrait, portraits that he was doing, this, these simplified grand manner portraits, and uh, does more and more bust or half-length likenesses, usually about 30 inches by 25 inches, with the exception of some of his smaller pictures of, of children. We have several that are uh, dated to the uh, latter part of the first decade of the 19th century. This is Charles Mussey, dated 1806, done in Portland, Maine. Uh, this is a slightly older child, uh, not one or two years old, but probably seven to ten years old. And it's interesting that Brewster just as effectively captures that transition uh, from childhood into adolescence to young adulthood. It's very, very, uh, I think, um, very interesting that he's able to capture someone on the verge of, of becoming a, a, a young adult. And he must have had, his parents must have had just enough money for a thumb. <laughs> <clears throat> William Temple Cutts uh, from the Sacro Museum, done at about the same time. Looks like he's holding an apple. Another member of that very important family. And one of, really one of the great Brewsters, uh, one shoe off, <laughs> done in 1807. Um, the, this portrait is signed and, and dated, and it has a, uh, a name on the stretcher that suggests a Connecticut origin. So again, it shows maybe Brewster still going back and forth. It is just a, a fantastic portrait. Again, very simplified, uh, very unified composition, very striking. Uh, and this child posed against a fairly neutral background except for that patterned, either patterned carpet or painted floor. A couple of little visual tricks here. Uh, the bow of the shoe that's on the child's foot mimics the pattern of the, uh, the floor. And then if you look closely at the bare left foot, you'll see traces of red paint that indicate that Brewster originally painted the child with both shoes on and decided as an afterthought to put the one shoe in her hand, probably to add some color to the center part of the canvas and lead your eye upward uh, to the face. So it shows a little bit about his working methods. That red would not have been visible in 1807. It becomes visible uh, over age as some pigment layers become uh, translucent. But a terrific, terrific picture. I have a couple of miniatures that Brewster did at about this time. This is a miniature of an unidentified man, about 1810. Booster was able to do everything that he could do in a full-size canvas in a very, very small chip of ivory, a very, these very intimate portraits. It's a miniature of a man named Joseph Wales, uh, signed and dated. You can see that over to the right, the signature on the edge of the ivory, uh, signed and dated 1807. And here's an interesting one. Six children, done about this same time, between 1805 and 1807, uh, this, is, uh, this is somebody that wanted portraits of all six of his children, but only wanted one 30 by 25 inch canvas. <clears throat> and unlike a trained artist, Brewster could not show six children naturalistically playing together in a dining room or living room or, or parlor or whatever. He did six separate portraits in six distinct sections uh, of this canvas. Each of them uh, could be a portrait in and of itself. Uh, so it's very, uh, very different from his known body of work, uh, kind of a, an outlier in terms of his known body of work. But one interesting thing about it, there's something a little odd about that child on the upper right. And if you look closely, she actually has a dead eye, her right eye, and Brewster shows it as such. In this, in this time, that's very common. Uh, it's what we call the warts and all approach. Uh, to portrait painting. These things are not glossed over, not at this level of, of art making, and quite often do appear uh, in the likenesses. And it's interesting that Bruce, from Brewster's perspective to paint a child with a, such an, an obvious uh, disability. And that leads us uh, to Mary Coffin, uh, done at about this time, done at about 1810, an absolutely stunning uh, example of Brewster's uh, portraits of children, a beautiful, uh, beautiful, I think, uh, example of the affinity that he had uh, with children. Just one of the most innocent, forthright, engaging, compelling uh, images of uh, the one-year-old uh, Mary Coffin. His, um, 
his brother's wife's niece, I believe. They lived only a few miles from the Brewster household uh, in Buxton. Uh, and uh, again, look at the, the, the size and importance of the eyes in relation to the head and the rest of the body. Uh, the simplicity of this composition. The only uh, detail uh, of, of any note is the, um, the thing that she holds in her hand, which I guess could be a, a rattle, but I haven't seen a rattle looking like that. It could easily be a sander uh, for sanding uh, ink. Wouldn't have been an in in instrument that the child would have used, but it would have been something for the child to hold to help get her through uh, the portrait sitting. Mary Coffin is similar to a number of other portraits uh, of the same uh, period, uh, most notably <clears throat> the child with a peach at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, another example done in, in very sim with a very similar composition uh, uh, to Mary Coffin. We don't know uh, who the child is, but just absolutely beautifully painted. And then another uh, portrait of a child, very, very similar uh, to Mary Coffin in a private collection. It was originally dated 1824, but I think it's much closer to 1810. And if you look at it in relation to Mary Coffin and the child with a peach, I think you can see they, these three uh, belong together. They really must have been done at about the same time. Another likeness done at about this time, uh, a little bit different, Elizabeth Abigail uh, Wellingford from Kennebunkport, done in 1808. She's in the Brick Store Museum. Uh, it's unusual, full length, but seated. It's very interesting. The sitter's mother had died just a few months before this was painted. This was her, her only child. And uh, she wears a red stone uh, brooch with her mother's initials, sits in a very rarely depicted upholstered child's chair. Uh, the book is very interesting with a marbleized paper. Uh, Abigail, the, um, the subject of this portrait, uh, or Abigail, her mother, uh, died at the age of 23, and then uh, Elizabeth grew up uh, only to uh, die at the same age, uh, 23, uh, same age as her mother when she died. The, some of the stories are tragic but interesting, and I just can't help repeating them sometimes. This is another great uh, picture, a boy with a book at the Griswold Museum. Also done at this time, Brewster begins to add amber tones to his portraits. And uh, you can see the, the palette getting a, a little darker as time goes on. Very similar to the boy with the book is this uh, boy with the bird uh, down in the, the Crashes collection. Another very compelling likeness of a soon-to-be young man. Uh, and just as compelling as the children's portraits. And um, as I said, very forthright in this case, even having a halo around the boy's head to draw your attention to him even, even further. And then um, Moses Quimby, a, a portrait uh, from about 1810 that's in the collection of Bowdoin College uh, in Maine. There are several portraits from the 18-teens that are known. <clears throat> they place Brewster in Connecticut and, and Maine, but also in Vermont. But in 1817, his life takes a turn. Uh, he enrolls in the, uh, as a member of the first class uh, of the Connecticut Asylum for the Education and Instruction of Deaf and Dumb Persons uh, in Hartford, Connecticut. There are only seven pupils in the class. Uh, Mason Cogswell was one of the founders of the school and his daughter Alice was deaf and she was one of the first uh, members of the class. She worked very closely with Thomas Hopkins uh, Gallaudet, who really is the one who pioneered American Sign Language, based it on the French system of deaf education and brought it to America. There was no unified sign language in the United States. There were pockets, communities that had different sign languages, almost as, almost as if they were dialects. Very important community out in Martha's Vineyard that formed the basis for what Gallaudet turned into American Sign Language and that we're all witnessing uh, here tonight. And so uh, the first class, as I said, had seven pupils. This is the building that the asylum was housed in. It later became very well known as the American Asylum and built a, a much larger uh, neoclassical building. <clears throat> but Brewster was a little bit out of place here. I mean, it must have been a thrilling experience, but he was 51 years old. Uh, most of the students were in their teens or 20s. And he was only one of two students who were self-supporting, who had been self-supporting uh, prior to going there. But he enrolls uh, in that very first class in the curriculum as stated by the school 
uh, was to instruct the mind by means of signs, writing pictures, the manual alphabet, artificial speech, and uh, reading the lips. And so it, it just must have been a spellbinding experience uh, for Brewster's first experience, perhaps, with fluent conversation and with social and intellectual exchange. No portraits are known from the time period he was in the asylum. Uh, and interestingly, interestingly enough, when he left, he went back to his old way of life, went back to the hearing community that had patronized him as a portrait painter, did not stay to be part of any uh, newly formed or existing deaf community. Uh, he seemed to be more comfortable, uh, even with his new knowledge, uh, doing what he had been doing for decades. And so he goes back up uh, to Maine and continues to paint and just paints uh, beautiful portraits, uh, continues to paint, renewed, I think, the greater depth and strength in some of the characterizations. This is Sarah Cogswell Thornton done in 1820. The faces sometimes get a little bit uh, increasingly somber, more heavy shadowing. Uh, most of these portraits are half length and format. This man is very important in Brewster's career. His name is Hezekiah Prince, and he was another diarist, and in the, uh, the 1820s, he wrote diary entries that document uh, nine different Brewster portraits in his town of Thomaston, Maine. Uh, but Brewster painted this in 1823. Uh, Henry Sayward, he did in 1824. You can see, still a compelling portrait of a child, but you can see it's a little more hard-edged than some of the earlier ones. Uh, still beautifully done, but uh, very different, I think, feel uh, to this one. Uh, this is a portrait that we attributed to Brewster when we did the show. It's the only one that we know of done on a wood panel instead of canvas, but the similarities were striking enough that we, uh, we do believe that it was done by him. It's an unidentified man. And then the Reverend Daniel Merritt <coughs> of Standish, Maine, done in March of 1831, really does show Brewster's late uh, style. Um, in 1833, John Brewster becomes a property owner for the first time. And interestingly enough, he does it by buying his brother, Royal Brewster, Brewster's house and farm. It's interesting. Brewster John, the portrait painter, obviously did better in his career than Royal Brewster, the physician. And he ends up buying Brewster's house so that Royal Brewster and his wife can still live there. Uh, after Royal Brewster dies in 1835, John sells the property back to his widow for a fraction of the price, so that she's the outright owner. Very little is known of Brewster's life after 1835. Uh, in 1850, there was a grand ceremony at the asylum. Lots of dignitaries, lots of alums, over 400 people attended. Brewster was not among them. He never gave money to the school. Uh, he never painted likenesses of anyone associated with the school that we know of. Um, it's very, very interesting. Perhaps he had made his way in the hearing world for so long, uh, he didn't feel the need to seek out a deaf community to, to support him or, or for socializing. Uh, it's also interesting, sometimes in his later life, you have to read the silences to draw conclusions about him. None of his relatives, including his parents, provided for him in their wills, which suggests, strongly suggests that he was self-supporting. He himself left no will or estate that we know of or could find. <clears throat> but he was buried with Royal Brewster and his family in Torrey Hill Cemetery in Buxton Lower Corners. And his epitaph is simply John Brewster died August 13th, 1854, age 88. In terms of his legacy, uh, I think it's very obvious he was a key uh, formulator of uh, style of folk portraiture that derives from the English grand manner and spread throughout New England with his help and then later to New York State and beyond. He's the most prolific painter of Maine people uh, in the federal era. He's widely recognized as one of the greatest deaf artists, certainly one of America's great folk painters, and I would say one of America's great portrait painters. I would say perhaps America's greatest painter of children. Uh, and I think his profound sensitivity to his sitters proves that he did not live alone in his silent world. Rather, he engaged humanity and created a lasting tribute to the gentler side of human nature. I, uh, I think in some, Brewster's genius for painting uh, lay in the utter simplicity of his canvases and the serenity in which his sitters seemed to repose uh, for all time. Thank you very much.
questions if you'd like. Are there any questions? I usually wrap things up so neatly. <laughs> people are left with absolutely nothing. Yes, I see one over here. How do um, painters of that time get supplies? You can buy supplies quite easily. In fact, uh, I, the two large Magat paintings that he did in 1799, Magat had a, a, a uh, basically a, a, a general dry goods store, and uh, pigments were widely available. Paper and canvas was pretty widely available. It was usually made in um, the cities and uh, brought to you know the stores in the countryside. Uh, certainly, in, in enough uh, quantity for artists like Brewster to be able to get their hands on it, that was not much of a challenge. It was learning what to do with it that was the challenge. And I think Brewster, uh, when he studied quote unquote with Joseph Stewart probably learned how to grind and mix pigments and how to prepare a canvas. Mm -hmm. The basic you know, artisan uh, functions that have to be done before you can even begin to do the design layer of painting. So not that, yeah, that was less of a, a problem than, than one might think. Yes? Um, is there more pictures with a stark background than those minimal little tree backgrounds? There are only a few with the trees. Only a few. Most of them are neutral backgrounds like Mary Coffin. Do you think he played with the negative space? Yes. Uh, well, the, he play, he, the only thing he does with the negative space in most of these portraits is a subtle gradation of the, uh, of the color of the paint from dark on the edges to light as it nears the, the head, as you can see in, in Mary's uh, portrait. But I think there are only probably less than 10 that I could think of off the top of my head that have the landscape background, and it's all of them are around 1805 to 1815, and I can't explain exactly why they would be concentrated that, you know, that much. There's, yes? Why would they call them deaf and dumb? Now, that's a period term. We wouldn't use that term today. By period, I mean that's what they were called back in 1817. A dumb meant unable to speak. It did not mean stupid. And so it's not a term we use in relation to deaf people today because we don't want to assume that deaf people don't have intelligence. They're often extremely intelligent. And so that's, that's something I should have made that clearer. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, in the back. Are there any known self-portraits by Brewster? Any known self-portraits? No. Unfortunately, no. And self-portraits are rare to begin with. Uh, there aren't many folk <coughs> painters that uh, have extant self-portraits, but and unfortunately, you know, Brewster is among those that don't. Sorry to say. Yes. Is there any known photographs of him? Of photographs? Right. No. That would be that would be quite quite a find. Would love to know what he looked like, but no, no evidence of what he looked like. I'm just curious about some of the male portraits. Um, is there anything to the fact that there are almost no I'm sorry, any significance to the fact? In fact, they have, they have almost no, no shoulders. They look almost like um, very, very poorly defined shoulders. Hmm. I, don't, I don't think that it's anything that I would attach any significance to, but I always have an open mind about these sort of things. Um, I haven't noticed anything about the shoulders that was anomalous, but uh, everybody sees things differently. That's interesting. I'll have to go back and take another look, but nothing that nothing that would come to mind. Other questions? Yes. Do you know if any of the subjects were deaf at all? We don't. Uh, we don't have any evidence that any of the subjects were deaf. Yes, again. Um, was was John Brewster Jr. born by by born deaf? Or was born deaf or deaf by disease? He was born deaf, by, according to his own newspaper ads. Born deaf and unable to speak, and as he put it, deaf and dumb. Anyone else? I'm curious about the payment scale. Um, are there any known categories of what determined what would be allowed to paint it for a certain amount of money? He advertised, generally speaking, in the um, early years of the 19th century, I think about $15 for a um, standard portrait, 30 inches by 25, half length, $5 for a miniature. And then any additional uh, 
embellishments? I'm sure there were always upcharges. <laughs> <laughs> These artists were, were in this for the business, and, and I. I think just looking at these, um, you can see some of them have considerably more uh, embellishment than, than others, and I'm sure that doesn't come uh, without a cost. And we do know from other artists that uh, there were itemizations of things that uh, determined what would and would not be in a portrait. So can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. So do you think he was painting these paintings um, to make beautiful paintings, I mean, to make a master, to make masterpieces, or do you think it was purely business, or somewhere in between? It's it's a real it's a combination of the two, and you could say this about any sure. artist. Um, masterpiece was not a term that would have been in his vocabulary artistically. Do you know what I mean? He was not out to paint masterpieces. He was out to paint lovely, compelling portraits that people would like and buy. And in so doing, he created masterpieces. Uh, but I think that uh, he is one of this class of artists that in the course of the daily pursuit of making a living did something of lasting beauty. What a lovely thing to end on, ah, I think. Um, You're very welcome.